My name is Marie Hoyerova, and I'm a senior advisor in the research department of the ECB, and it will be my pleasure to guide you through this session. We have two very topical papers and two discussions on the program. The first paper is on optimal monetary policy with a nonlinear Phillips curve, and the presenter is our very own Anton Nakov. Anton is a principal economist in the monetary policy research division of the ECB. Anton, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marie, and thank you all for having me present this uh, uh, work, which is joint with uh, Peter Caradi, Galo Nuno, Ernesto Pasten, and Dominic Thaler. And I should say uh, these are our own views and not necessarily coincide with those of the uh, central banks that we work for. So let me begin by uh, showing you two figures. Um, hopefully I can click here. Um, documenting that the recent inflation surge featured an increase in the frequency of price changes, and this you can see as the red dashed line here um, for the US, showing an increase from a frequency of around 10% per month to around 20% per month, that's on the right-hand side scale, just as inflation rose from around 2% to closer to 10% uh, in the US also, documented by Montag and Villar. And at the same time, there was an increase in the Phillips curve slope, as for example, shown by Cerato and GT uh, across US cities. You can see that uh, the slope of the correlation between inflation and employment changed dr dramatically between uh, um, the uh, pre-COVID period and the post-COVID period, which is here the red uh, circles show the much steeper slope uh, post-COVID. Now, um, that notwithstanding, optimal monetary policy uh, is mainly studied in models in which the frequency is held constant and the Phillips curve is linear. And a lot of progress has been made uh, under these assumptions. Uh, um, for example, in the textbook by uh, Jordi Galli and Mike Woodford. But we want to move away from these assumptions, uh, consistent with the evidence that we've seen during the inflation surge. And we want to study uh, what does optimal monetary policy look like with a nonlinear Phillips curve and uh, with endogenous variation in frequency. And from a policy perspective, the question that we address is how should central banks respond to large inflation surges? So what we do is um, that we use a standard state-dependent pricing model, the one of Golosov and Lucas. And uh, that's uh, probably uh, the right place to start since it's a very well-known familiar model of state-dependent pricing. We solve it non-linearly using an appropriate technique that uh, um, um, I won't have time uh, to go into a lot of detail, but we can talk over the break. And we do uh, two things. Uh, in terms of positive analysis, we study the behavior of the model under a Taylor rule. So we trace the responses uh, to shocks of different sizes, and then we address, assess the nonlinearity of the Phillips curve. Then we move to a normative analysis, the core of the paper, where we study the Ramsey op optimal policy, and there uh, it includes the optimal long-run inflation. Uh, we trace the responses uh, which are optimal to shocks of different types, and we characterize the targeting rule after a large cost push shock in particular. So uh, to remove any suspense, let me briefly uh, summarize our results. Um, in this model, the Phillips curve is indeed nonlinear. Uh, it gets steeper as frequency increases, and the rising frequency is key for, for that fact. And uh, it turns out that in response to small shocks for which the Phillips curve is locally linear, optimal monetary policy is similar to the one under Calvo pricing, the familiar one from the textbooks. Uh, now, in response to efficiency shocks, both uh, large and small, and uh, for example, you can think of a TFP shock that affects the efficient allocation, there is divine coincidence just as in Ancavo model. So the central bank optimally stabilizes inflation fully and closes the output gap. But there are differential responses to small and large cost push shocks, and this is where we focus our analysis. 
And it uh, turns out the optimal monetary policy leans aggressively against inflation when the frequency rises. We call this, it strikes while the iron is hot, to refer to the fact that the central bank seizes the window of opportunity to strike down inflation at a time when the sacrifice ratio is especially low, okay? And I will say more things about this uh, in a few slides. In the interest of time, I will skip most of the related literature, just point to two papers. The one, of course, by Golosov and Lucas, which is a seminal paper that micro-founded state-dependent pricing model with a menu cost and idiosyncratic shocks to firms. Uh, and the model uh, that we use is a very close cousin to, to their model. And a recent paper by Karateli and Halperin, who also study optimal monetary policy with menu costs. However, they study sectoral shocks. Unlike us, we focus on an aggregate shocks that affects all firms across the economy. Okay, so let me say a few words about the model. It's a heterogeneous firm DSG model with a fixed cost of price adjustment, a household consume a Dixie Stiglitz aggregate of goods and work and save. Firms produce differentiated goods using labor only and are subject to aggregate shocks, such as TFP shock or the cost push shock, and idiosyncratic shocks, okay? And they have market power and set prices optimally subject to a fixed cost of price adjustment, so-called menu cost, as in also Lucas. In terms of monetary policy, in the positive part of the paper, we assume that the central bank follows a Taylor rule. And in the normative part of the paper, we assume that instead that it, uh, the interest rate is set optimally to maximize household welfare and their commitment. So an intuitive uh, summary of the model goes as follows. In each period, firms choose whether to reset their price, and if so, what new price to set. The firm's optimality conditions define the reset price in the inaction region, called sometimes the SS band. And given the idiosyncratic shock, this determines endogenously the price distribution. And if we denote by little p uh, the quality adjusted relative price, and by x the price gap, the distance between this price and the optimal price, the figure here shows the distribution of these price gaps in steady state. And in steady state, what happens is that after uh, these idiosyncratic shocks, those firms and those prices that happen to be far away from the optimum, they are denoted here by the dark shaded uh, areas, are the ones that get adjusted, okay? They make relatively large price changes, and this gives rise to a so-called selection effect uh, that uh, in the interest of time, I won't uh, explain here, but Basically, it's a correlation between the probability of adjustment and the size of adjustment that makes the Phillips curve steeper in this model. Now, what we're interested in is how this model behaves in response to large shocks. And here, a completely different thing happens in the sense that the, the entire distribution of firms get shifted here to the left, if you think of a positive monetary shock. And so um, this has a limited impact on the SS bands themselves, but it pushes a large fraction of firms outside the inaction region. And, and that means that a large increase in the frequency of price changes occurs, which imparts additional flexibility over the aggregate price level, okay, on top of this selection effect. So you can see here this by this uh, blue shaded uh, area to the left of the lower S band. Okay, and this is uh, much bigger than the, the fraction of adjusting firms which uh, happen in steady state, which are the two uh, tails in, that I showed earlier. So we are studying welfare, so it's important to point out what distortions there are in the model. And under monopolistic competition and nominal frictions, there are three distortions. Inefficient markup fluctuations related to output gap uh, volatility, price dispersion, and price adjustment or menu costs. Um, okay, let me also not spend much time on this calibration. We uh, use as much as possible the um, related literature, in particular Golosov and Lucas's paper itself, Smets and Wouters, and so on only to mention that we match the um, size and uh, frequency of price changes by, uh, uh, adjust by estimating the menu cost and the standard deviation of uh, the idiosyncratic shock. And we do so to match these uh, moments from Nakamura and Stice in 2008. 
So the frequency is 8.7% per month, and the size of the average of uh, price change is around 8.5% in that data set. Um, okay, so let us move to the positive results. As I said, in this model, the Phillips curve is nonlinear. And to see this, consider first uh, the model under a Taylor rule um, and Calvo pricing. This gives the red dashed line on the left figure, which as you see is a, a basically a straight line, uh, such that the output gap uh, increases and, and together with inflation. Okay, the output gap is on the horizontal axis and inflation on the vertical axis. Now, uh, in the Calvin model, the frequency is held constant, which explains the, uh, why the Phillips curve is uh, a straight line. Whereas in the menu cost model, frequency moves with the size of the shock, and there we get this very uh, uh, nonlinear S-shaped curve that you see in blue, such that um, the Phillips curve uh, is also rising with the output gap and in, in inflation are also positively correlated for small shocks, but for large shocks, something happens in that the Phillips curve banks, uh, bends backward. And so, uh, you know, as, as the money shock becomes larger and larger, uh, it goes more and more into inflation and less into output. And in the limit of the model in which the shock is so large as to make all the firms adjust, everything goes into prices and nothing goes into real effects, okay? So they align asymptotes back to zero. Again, this is related to the movement in frequency, which you see in the middle figure, where frequency starts at around 8% uh, at zero inflation. But as you move around, away from zero inflation, the frequency of repricing increases and uh, asymptotes one for very large inflation rates. Okay, this you can see in the middle figure. And in the right figure, you see the slope of the Phillips curve. Basically, that's the, the slope of the curve that I show on the, on the left uh, panel. And you see that it also increases substantially with an increase in the frequency of repricing. Now, uh, we are interested uh, in the normative uh, aspects of this model. And for that, uh, um, we apply um, a novel solution method that in the interest of time I'll skip, but we can talk about it in the Q&A or in the break. Um, so let me just move on and go directly to our first normative result, which is regarding the optimal long run inflation rate. In this model, it turns out that the Ramsey steady state inflation is slightly above zero at around 25 basis points. And uh, it's close to the inflation rate that minimizes the steady state frequency of price adjustment. Mm. Why is it not exactly zero as in the textbook Calvo model? Well, there is uh, an asymmetry of the profit function, which leads to asymmetric SS bands. And in particular, a negative price gap is less desirable than a positive price gap of the same size. This means that at zero inflation, there is more mass of uh, firms or prices around the lower S band than around the higher S band. And uh, slightly positive inflation actually uh, raises uh, the optimal price and pushes the mass of firms to the right back inside the SS band. This leads to lower frequency and lower price adjustment costs. So this is the figure that illustrates this. And uh, just notice that the lower SS band, the lower S band, there is more firm, there are more prices there. It's slightly higher than the right, uh, the right S band, the upper uh, uh, boundary of the inaction region. Um, okay, so um, with that, uh, let us move on to the uh, systematic monetary policy, the optimal responses to shocks. And in particular, let's study first cost push shocks. They are relevant and interesting, not only because some argue the recent inflation surge was triggered by this type of shock, but uh, also because uh, they uh, generate meaningful trade-offs between inflation and output stabilization for central banks. And we know that in a linearized Calvo world, optimal policy is a flexible inflation targeting rule of the type that you see in this equation. Inflation and the change in the output gap are negatively related with a coefficient of proportionality minus one over epsilon, where epsilon is the elasticity of substitution uh, between goods. And notice that this slope is independent of the frequency of repricing or the slope of the Phillips curve. 
And uh, um, well, uh, why is that? Because an increase in the frequency raises the slope of the Phillips curve, which is, uh, we can call it kappa, but it also raises the weight of the output gap in welfare, which is uh, lambda, which is equal to kappa over epsilon. And they exactly offset each other. And well, so why? Because more price flexibility in the Kavu model uh, always implies that inflation is less costly. Now, for small cost push shocks, it turns out that the slope of the targeting rule in Golosov and Lucas is also minus one over epsilon. And that's, uh, um, we find is very nice. But uh, we are interested in large shocks, and therefore we characterize globally the targeting rule by showing this um, uh, scatter plot of inflation and changes in the output gap in this space by the blue line compared to the dashed red line. And you see that uh, um, globally the target rule is very nonlinear. And uh, in particular, uh, after large shocks, the planner stabilizes inflation a lot more relative to the output gap. And this is what we call the st uh, strike, it, uh, strike while it, uh, it's hot. Why? Because um, you know, stabilizing inflation is cheaper due to the lower sacrifice ratio. When frequency of repricing is higher, there is a window of opportunity to affect inflation without much of an output loss, and the central bank optimally makes use of this opportunity by lowering inflation more than it would in the Calvo model for the same size of the shock. Now, one could say, but your welfare is different because you have the menu cost, and so the, the objective function of the central bank is slightly different. Well, we do a, a test of that uh, a conjecture by in, uh, you know, putting the quadratic objective of the Calvo model, which is a good approximation of welfare in the Calvo model, as we know, into our uh, menu cost model. And it turns out that the results are very similar. This is the yellow dotted line here. Uh, we again obtain the fact that the central bank links aggressively against inflation for large shocks. And so the nonlinearity of the targeting rule is really due to the nonlinear Phillips curve. Um, um, okay, and um, another way of seeing the nonlinearity is uh, to plot the cumulative real rate deviation. So that's the, if you wish, uh, like a summary statistics of the stance of monetary policy. So what real interest rates the central bank promises from now until the future. And you see that, again, uh, as inflation increases, you know, the, the central bank promises higher and higher real interest rates and delivers higher interest rates than it would in the Calvo model, which, again, is the dashed uh, red line. OK. Um, we also study the optimal responses to efficiency shocks. So these are shocks that affect the efficient allocation, such as shocks to total factor productivity. And uh, we know that in the Newcastle model with Calvo pricing, <coughs> a divine coincidence result obtains and after TFP shocks and other shocks affecting the efficient allocation, and in uh, such that the optimal policy fully stabilizes inflation and closes the output gap. So this is the complete opposite of looking through, right? It's completely stabilizes inflation. Uh, we show analytically that after such a shock, uh, divine coincidence also holds in the menu cost model. Inflation is fully stabilized at steady state and the output gap is closed. Okay, that's independent of the size of the shock, so it's an analytical result. And with that, let me conclude. I'm a bit earlier. Um, um, mm, so the optimal monetary policy uh, with state-dependent pricing, which we study, uh, is um, one of a nonlinear targeting rule. Um, so the optimal long run inflation is near zero. It's slightly positive, around 25 basis points. There is divine coincidence for efficiency shocks. And um, for small shocks, uh, cost push shocks, the optimal response is similar to Calvo. And that's because the low, lower welfare weight on inflation offsets the higher slope of the Phillips curve. But for large cost shocks, we have that the central bank uh, should lean ag aggressively against inflation and strike while the iron is hot. So thank you very much. And
The discussant is Guido Ascari. Guido is Professor of Economics at the University of Pavia and Economic Advisor and Head of Monetary Policy Research at the Dutch Central Bank. Guido, the floor is yours. Okay, so thanks uh, Marie and thanks uh, for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the SCB and uh, discuss uh, this paper by uh, Anton and uh, you know, Peter Regalo, uh, etc. So I'm still not used to put the disclaimer, but since I'm also working for the Dutch Central Bank, you know, everything I say, it doesn't imply uh, uh, the view of the uh, DMB. Okay, so let me first uh, praise the paper as any very you know, gentle discussion. So uh, it's a very nice paper, uh, technically challenging, uh, actually. Uh, but despite that, the intuition of what is happening is clear. Anton did a great job in, uh, in presenting it. It's very neat, it's a pleasure to read, and I do uh, urge you to, to, to read the paper uh, because uh, it's very insightful. And uh, as I said, very easy to read. So the main question is also very clear. Uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's optimal monetary policy, which is something we understand very well in a menu cost model, meaning with endogenous frequency of price setting. So it's a very defined question. With uh, using the methodology, a very well-known state-dependent model, Golos and Lucas. There are very good reasons to choose Golos and Lucas, which is, if you, in a sense, uh, very loosely speaking, is the most state-dependent model in some sense. So you want to go to the polar case. Uh, they also do the the Calvo Plus in the paper, so the paper is very rich also in that respect. The main uh, point is that you get nonlinear Phillips curve in Calvo is approximately uh, linear. Uh, in Calvo and nonlinear in state dependent model, this is well known. It's not something that uh, is, uh, is new. Um, and inflation in this model is bad because the frequency of uh, manual cost firms, um, the, uh, increasing the frequency means that firms have to pay manual cost. So this is similar to price dispersion in a sense, and, uh, and I will say something more uh, about that uh, later. But here, the source of um, of the distortion and of the cost of uh, nominal GD comes from manual cost, and the higher is inflation, the more uh, firms are going to pay this cost. The really new thing, and uh, what is uh, really much to like to the paper, is the optimal monetary policy in this setting in a fully nonlinear uh, way. So the model is solved nonlinear, the optimal monetary policy is solved nonlinearly, and they're uh, using a new algorithm. And as usual in this uh, state-dependent pricing literature, then uh, they compare with Calvo, right? Because that's kind of the, the model that uh, is by far used, especially in empirical application or operational model of DSG model estimated uh, and that we use in central banks. So the main results, uh, to summarize, uh, they first do Taylor rule uh, to show that the, the, the Phillips curve is nonlinear. And again, you get similar to Calvo for small shock, but not for large shocks. Then uh, the core of the paper is the normative analysis, as, uh, as I said, and uh, Anton also uh, stressed. So the optimal steady state inflation is positive, while it's zero in Calvo, and this is mainly due to the asymmetric profit function. There's a nonlinear Phillips curve. There is a nonlinear targeting optimal rule. That means that they should tighter uh, the response, the larger the shock, because you want to exploit the more favorable trade-off that uh, the endogenous frequency uh, creates. Divine coincidence holds, time consistency problem, and to didn't talk about that, is also a nice result, is weaker than in Calvo for reasons that are kind of obvious, because again, the trade-off actually get worse in this case, right? Because you're gonna create inflation, and uh, the more you create inflation, the less you get bank of the buck if you have state dependent pricing. Okay, so the main conclusion is uh, what they call strikes while the iron is hot. And uh, I quote here from the paper, our research underscores the importance of an aggressive anti-inflationary policy by the central bank in the face of large shocks. And that's a potentially very important topic or result in the face of the discussion, the recent discussion about uh, should we look through supply shocks or, or not. The results here is very sharp and clear. You should be actually more aggressive, right? You should not look through cost supply shock, but actually the opposite. Now, for me, this was a very difficult dis you know, paper to discuss. And the reason is because uh, you know, there's nothing I can teach to Anton or Peter about state-dependent pricing model. Uh, they're world experts. 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm editing a uh, handbook of inflation, and uh, there was a chapter on state-dependent model to be written. I asked Anton and Jim to, <laughs> to write it. So that's uh, about how I think uh, <laughs> highly about, uh, about the authors in this uh, research uh, topic. I'm, I'm, I'm not into, yeah, again, I have nothing to teach to Gallo or, or Dominic about, you know, the uh, nonlinear algorithm that, that they're using that for me is very hard to get. So um, I apologize. I'm going to have some very high level comments. Uh, uh, and then I will shamelessly actually uh, talk about some ongoing work that I have with co authors that I think is very related uh, to, to this. Okay, so the first uh, thing is that this paper surely is not in what I call the Saving Private Calvo camp, right? And actually, a quote from, uh, from the paper, this policy prescription diverges markedly from that of a standard New Keynesian model. So what is the Saving Private Calvo camp? There are lots of papers that depend on pricing and more literature that, you know, they do a lot of stuff and then they show, but, you know, Calvo is not too bad. And, you know, uh, there are an old paper by Woodford, which I think is one of the first. There's a paper that I love. I quote in my uh, grad teaching class by, uh, by uh, Kio Midegan in JME. And there's a very recent paper by Euclert uh, at co-authors that uh, actually Anton and, and uh, co-authors quote a lot. That exactly make, makes this point. Right? So you're very fine using Calvo model and go on with that, unless the shocks are very big. And, you know, I love those papers. I love those papers because I'm a very simple-minded guy. I've been working with Calvo model for 30 years. If someone comes out and say, you know, you're fine with that, I'm happy. And also, you know, because these models are very difficult to put, this the dependent pricing model, very difficult to put in an operational, you know, educational model that you want to estimate to bring to the data, fully fledged. At the moment, we are not there yet. And this paper instead uh, says that this is not the case. And my first comment is, well, really? And I argue that they are camping actually very close by to the Saving Private Capital camp. And the reason is uh, many pictures in the paper. So one is this. So I had uh, this, uh, this line. Uh, that's my contribution. So that's the nonlinear Phillips curve. <laughs> uh, actually, there were, in the, in the fight that I showed, there were also animations, but anyway, they don't work here. So, uh, so when, you know, eyeballing, uh, when actually the nonlinear Phillips curve actually kicks in, respect to the Calvo model, well, some, something around here, I go here, this is 50% inflation, so that's about, what, 20 or something. You know, the, we are all talking about this inflation surge, uh, was dramatic, uh, never seen. Peak of inflation in Europe, October 2022, month to month, annualized 10%. Right? So year over year, much less. Inflation, that's the Taylor rule. Uh, they have this picture. Actually, in the Taylor rule, what happens is that uh, you, you get more inflation after cost push shock. And the reason is, uh, is because uh, obviously you have endogenous frequency, so inflation is going to react more. Uh, but again, you know, when is this thing is going to kick in again, you get inflation higher than 10. The same for the optimal policy. So that's the optimal policy cost push shock, change in trade off. Wow, when this thing is going to move from the Calvo line, which is the, uh, the dash line, again, above, you know, 15 or surely about 10, more than 10. Uh, finally, the nonlinear optimal targeting rule that uh, Anton shows, and again here, you know, when this thing is really going to matter is for very high and very large shock. So possibly shocks we have never seen. So again, you know, I'm sitting in the camp and say, okay, good. Uh, so the other thing is that, uh, okay, this is a bit messy because it was supposed to be animated, but <laughs> anyway, so there are three components of the welfare function. As uh, Anton said, so there is average markup and price dispersion. These are still there also in the Calvo model. In this model, there's a third component more, which is the menu cost. But if you look at the total welfare function, which is here, well, they look very similar. So, I mean, if I use Calvo model, I use the same welfare function, done. I'm pretty much there. Actually, I'm very much there. And the reason is because, 
you know, there is a kind of exchange between menu cost and price dispersion. So this is the price dispersion. We know that under Calvo model, price dispersion is very costly. You can see here. While uh, here, instead, you have a price dispersion in the menu cost model, it's not going to you know, create any, any real distortion because of the endogenous frequency. So there's no much price dispersion going on here. But then what happens with inflation on deflation, so with big shocks, is that you're going to pay a lot of menu costs. Because in order to, you know, for the endogenous frequency, you don't have price dispersion, but you have to pay this menu cost. And then it's not clear to me also what these menu costs are. What's the difference? You know, lots of people talking about, yeah, price dispersion is ad hoc. It's not clear why, what is measuring. Well, menu cost also to me is not clear what is measuring. Uh, you know, there are lots of people that try to measure those. But they are not very successful. Uh, I think this one can think of both ways, of a kind of sense-reduced form to capture the um, inefficiency led by nominal rigidity or created by nominal rigidity because the signal of prices in the, uh, in the uh, an old idea that goes back to Hayek, right, is not efficient anymore because uh, of nominal rigidity, prices do not transmit uh, preferences and technology. Okay, so then the main results are revisited, the, the slides, uh, so normal, optimal, optimal steady state inflation is low, uh, so it's, it's not zero, but it's basically zero. The loneliness of Phillips curve targeting rule is there, but only for really very large shock, possibly never observed. The same for the nonlinear targeting rule. The planner preferences are basically the one of Calvo. Divine coincidence holds. So in my reading, is this is uh, private Calvo is actually saved also after this model. Okay. So why the difference between the two models might be actually underestimated uh, by the model? And I think uh, that uh, is possibly true, given that some simplifying assumptions that I think are due to numerical, uh, you know, uh, for numerical feasibility. Production function and utility are linear in labor. That makes, uh, I think, uh, the two models uh, more similar than otherwise. Uh, the risk aversion is also one. The elasticity substitution is not very high. The other thing is there's no trend inflation because the Ramsey policy is basically zero. So there's no role for trend inflation that we know has screwed up a uh, couple more than big time. Uh, so in this respect, maybe the next question will be how can this model generate a 2% optimal target, which is the one the central banks have. And here there are a couple of possibilities just uh, that we know from the literature. One is the relative price trends by Adam and Weber. And uh, the other one is the ZLB. I mean, at least in the literature has put a lot on the ZLB. So when you have a ZLB, uh, there's a recent paper by uh, Lulien Schölle showing that the higher inflation target, because of the higher frequency, a steeper Phillips curve, actually doesn't buy you a large uh, stance, right? Because reduced effective uh, policy space, in, uh, facing, you know, the literature, the, this literature about ZLB is about large demand shocks that drives you in the zero lower bound. And uh, if you have an endogenous freight free frequency, it, then uh, monetary policy in facing large shocks is less effective in supporting output because inflation reacts and you get less um, uh, effect on output. So, so if you have a very big shock that drives output to, uh, you know, to, to, to the payment that you want to support output, that uh, under endogenous price frequencies is very, it's more difficult than under exogenous price frequency. And therefore, the actual policy space is much less than the 2% that you think uh, that you get if you, for example, follow the Blanchard suggestion of increasing the inflation target from 2% to 4% to 2% to 4%. There is another paper that by, by Flora Budianto showing that in a Calvo model, there are also a lot of other stuff that, because, uh, that, that happens uh, because uh, trend inflation changes the relationship between the variables and the dynamics of the model. And therefore, that can be uh, something that uh, might apply also uh, to this model. The other thing I think is very key for this model is the empirical uh, relevance. So, the model is, like all the state dependent pricing model, is calibrated in order to match some moments. But the really key moment, the really key thing that they need here, and they do not calibrate, is how the model do reproduce the elasticity of the frequency of price changes with respect to inflation. 
And uh, the, the recent paper by, uh, by uh, Lulia and Scholle showed actually that uh, one estimate that we have in the literature, in a QGA paper by, uh, by Alvarez et al, very widely quoted, is actually wrong. And it seems that uh, the, uh, the, the frequency of price adjustment increased one to one almost with uh, the level of inflation which actually it means that increase big time, much big time, that, uh, a large time than, uh, than uh, I think this model uh, suggests. Uh, since I'm out of time, I, can I? Okay, oh, that's very good. Um, okay, so that's I think is, uh, is something that uh, you should try to match, you should try to convince that you are matching this uh, empirically, the, freq the change in the frequency with respect to the change in uh, inflation uh, in the data. Empirical relevance, and then uh, thanks, Marie, so I'll give you the opportunity to talk about the ongoing work, uh, work in progress with uh, a bunch of French guys. Uh, so uh, as I said, uh, you know, I would like to have this in an estimated model that I can estimate, I bring to the data, and do the usual stuff that we like to do, we love to do. So that what we do, so we have a cover frequency that is endogenous in a way that uh, you compare the value function of the average firm and the value function of the price resetting firm net of menu cost. And then you have this uh, logistic thing that such that this, uh, this thing is between zero and one. And then you can solve nonlinearly this model and you can estimate, uh, well, if you have Gautier as a quarter, you can estimate <laughs> with an inversion filter uh, this, uh, this model nonlinearly. So this is fully nonlinear, solved fully nonlinear, estimated. And what we get on the data, right? So this is estimated on the data. So that's the nonlinear Phillips curve. That's the banana that we get. Uh, and this is the curve when we actually keep the frequency. We have uh, the same stuff on prices and on wages. And uh, we get the banana exactly as, uh, as Anton and co-authors, but you can see that this thing is actually kicking in a much lower inflation rate because the data will tell you that that's what happens. That's also what we know, I think, from the Prisma uh, leech, uh, findings. Um, the other thing is that's the cover probability, right? And the cover probability in the model uh, is about 0 0.75, as usual, uh, jiggling around there. Uh, the unit, this is uh, European data, by the way. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, it drops. Uh, just look at the blue line for what matters. It drops to about two quarters during the recent inflation surge, as you would expect, okay? And again, this uh, is an empirical bite, and the empirical bite is this one. So let's look on the right, that's the historical decomposition that we all do. That's a fixed cover paper. What you see here in the inflation surge Right? It's all about markup shock and wage markup shock. That's the standard Smets uh, and Walters results. Inflation dynamics is all about cost push shocks. In this model with endogenous frags, we can see there's a lot of demand here going on. Right? And that's exactly because uh, you know, the endogenous price frequency, that's the uh, intuition also of Anton, is actually uh, making uh, prices react, uh, react a, a lot to cost push shock. And then finally, you have a state-dependent effects on monetary policy. That's about the trade-off that they have in, uh, in the paper, in a fully microfunded model we have also here. Empirically, so what are these impulse responses? So these are impulse responses uh, to a monetary policy shock uh, for uh, uh, inflation and uh, for the output gap at different point in time. Right? Because any quarter in our sample will give you a different impulse response function because it's a nonlinear model. So that completely depends on when you are in the, in, 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 the, in the data and what are the shocks that are hitting the model. And you can see here that this is 22 Q2. That's the highest uh, uh, inflation number that we have in the data. And uh, you have that the inflation uh, reacts, uh, uh, that's, uh, inflation reacts a lot while uh, the output gap uh, does not react. And when in fact, in, 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 instead uh, the cover probability is low, you have that the inflation reacts very little and the output gap reacts a lot. So that's changed the sacrifice ratio every quarter, quarter by quarter, uh, which is exactly what, uh, what they, we didn't do optimal policy. That's probably the next thing uh, that we do. And with that, I conclude. But uh, it's a fantastic paper, and uh, as I said, uh, you should try to read it. Thank you very much. Anton, why don't you take some time to respond to Guido? Yeah, uh, Guido, thanks a lot for this wonderful discussion. I should take more time to 
process all the information. Um, let me just uh, answer some of the points that you made. Um, well, first of all, yeah, it's true that the shocks that uh, are needed to uh, go to the nonlinear part of the Phillips curve are relatively large. Uh, um, but still, we think that um, if one indicator is the movement of the frequency, uh, we are not that far from such a region. We weren't that far from such a region. And you say inflation went to 10%, not to 20%. But that's, of course, conditional on monetary policy having reacted or promising to react over time. We don't know what would have happened if, you know, if central banks uh, decided to look through instead. If they had decided to look through, maybe inflation would have gone up to 20%. We, we don't know that counterfactual. They, they, have, they have looked through a little bit. Initially, yeah, but then they were very uh, much in line with, with our prescription, I would say, of uh, promising I don't know, to hike on an increasing part of interest rates for a sustained sure. period of time and so on. OK, um, what do we think about menu costs? We, uh, one interpretation, of course, the standard one is there. These are physical costs of changing price tags or the labor of uh, uh, time of people who have to do these price changes in supermarkets and so on. That's probably very small. Uh, by the way, the menu cost in our model is small. It's re less than half of a percent of firm's revenue, which is uh, very similar to what's Baratsky et al in 2004 estimate for uh, a, a bunch of firms in the US. Um, now, we think of that more broadly as managerial time that you need to figure out the right price. No, it's uh, firms uh, need uh, meetings to be held, managers, uh, staff, the pricing department, all these costs add up. And uh, we think of the menu costs as a stand-in in our model as a stand-in for this kind of cost. And there's also the psychological cost that Pedro was suggesting. So of course, it's a very uh, Mickey Mousey and abstract way of modeling costs. But the important thing here is that it's a fixed cost. It doesn't matter whether you're changing the price from $1 to $120 or from $1 to $2, you know, it's the same calculation cost. It involves us solving the same type of problem. So it's, I think, a fixed cost, which is proportional uh, to the wage. You know, it's a, it's a reasonable assumption. Um, how to generate 2% inflation target. In our model, it's really hard to generate this. We don't have the zero lower bound or relative price trends as uh, Adam and co-authors. Um, so uh, in, at least in this baseline model, uh, as much as we could get was 25 basis points, which I agree is, is far away from the actual um, inflation target of central banks. But um, there's only so much we can do about that. Um, how does the model reproduce the elasticity of frequency to inflation? I think that's an, a very important question. And indeed, our model, there is a theoretical bound uh, of that elasticity. And you can show that it's about 2 thirds. So infl you know, a doubling of inflation would increase the frequency by 2 thirds. 1 third goes to the size of price changes. Whereas you say this evidence by Eulier and Shonley is that it's 1 to 1. I haven't looked at that paper yet, but I'm very curious, and uh, I would like to think about this more. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for questions from the audience. I propose we collect several questions, three, four questions, and then let Anton respond. Please raise your hand, wait for a mic, stand up, state your name, and state your question. Shirley, please. Uh, Jordi Galli, Cray, and UPF. So there is a, um, a potential source of an asymmetry in your model uh, that could imply asymmetric um, optimal policy responses that didn't mm -hmm. seem to show up here, mm -hmm. which is the presence of uh, monopolistic competition. Mm -hmm. Okay, that uh, I don't know if uh, I think you didn't mention that. Do you correct for that to begin with? Yeah. In, uh, well, we do uh, correct for the steady state markup. Yeah, so uh, I, I think it would be in interesting to look at the, at the version in which you don't correct it, because mm -hmm. that, and, and, because, and then you, you, your technology allows you to 
yeah. to, to uncover these nonlinearities. So I think intuitively the response to a, um, an, a, a, an inflationary shock uh, should be uh, less aggressive than to a deflationary uh, shock because it would pu push you uh, closer to to the efficient uh, mm -hmm. uh, level of output. Um, so yes, yes. I think it would be mm -hmm. a, an avenue worth pursuing, even that you have the technology. Yeah, indeed, do we, we do an exercise where we solve for the time zero optimal policy, where we don't correct for the like you suggest for the monopolistic uh, distortion. And there you have the usual incentive to inflate. And so I, I think I agree with you that uh, the optimal policy may also feature such a muted response to an inflationary shock compared to a deflationary shock. But, that's, but that exploits the, the time zero uh, um, properties of optimal policy, you know, which are well understood and they have been studied. Uh, elsewhere in the literature, not of this particular model, but related models elsewhere in the literature. And so therefore, for the main um, uh, um, theoretical results on, on the optimal monetary policy response to cost push shock, we focus on this timeless perspective uh, exercise with the subsidy. Yeah, but that's a good point. Thank you. Butter? Bartosz Maciekowiak, ECB. So um, when you talked about the Calvo model or optimal policy in the Calvo model, you pointed out these two effects that end up canceling each other exactly mm -hmm. in the Calvo models. So there is this effect that as the frequency of price changes increases, on the one hand, um, the Phillips curve becomes uh, steeper, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, inflation becomes less socially costly, less mm -hmm. distortionary. And then, obviously, in your model, the first effect is stronger, mm -hmm. and you emphasize that. But do you have intuition about why the first effect is stronger than the second effect? I mean, a priori, it could be, it could have gone the other way. You mean for optimal monetary yeah. policy? Uh, so the frequency effect? OK, let me think about that. Um, I need to think about that. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, I need to think about that to reflect. Thank you, Bartosz. Can I ask you, Anton, so I think Guido mentioned Calvo Plus. How would your results look like in a more realistic model like Calvo Plus? Right. So we actually have a, an extension with the Calvo Plus model towards the end of the paper. That's relatively recent. But what I can say is that in more realistic models where, uh, which uh, try to match the um, observed uh, histograms of price changes and namely have a lot more small price changes than the, than the Golosov and Lucas model, uh, the main results go through, and that is because for large shocks, which what we are interested in, uh, these models behave uh, uh, in the limit as in the as the goes for Lucas model. Most of the adjustments occur because firms get outside of the SS bands, and the probability of adjustment approaches one, and therefore. Our uh, main result, which is a strike it while the iron is hot, is still valid in a, in a Calvo Plus model, as, uh, as in Nakamura and Steinson. Um, now, you could, of course, uh, have different types of uh, state-dependent models with a generalized adjustment hazard, such that the hazard doesn't rise all the way to one. And there, you would have a more muted effect, and you would be somewhere between our result and the Calvo linear uh, response. Um, but uh, that's, of course, uh, an empirical question. And uh, we decided to go with the polar case of Gosso Lucas because of didactic reasons. And uh, it's, uh, since it's the first paper to do this, it's, uh, I think, interesting to study the limiting case. We know Calvo, uh, which is the least state-dependent model. And, uh, and it's interesting to characterize the cost of Lucas, which is the most independent model. And then anything else would be in between these two. 
We are perfectly on time. Please join me in thanking Anton and Guido. <laughs> the second paper in the session is on markups and data intensive firms. The presenter is Jan Eichhout. Jan is a CREA professor uh, at the University of Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria, for uh, uh, having also the paper on the uh, program. This is joint work with uh, Lara Welcome from uh, uh, Colombia. And the question we're trying to answer is, is really what do firms do when they have more data? In particular, how are they going to price differently when they have more data? And of course, data uh, availability has changed a lot. Uh, uh, since basically the digital revolution and, and, and firms do a lot to uh, use and access uh, those data. And we're going to focus on something very specific. We're going to think of firms reducing basically or using the data to reduce the uncertainty about uh, uh, the, the demand for the goods that they sell. I don't want to claim that this is the only role that data has. I mean, I can think of a million other uh, roles that data have for firms. I can think of data as, uh, for example, if I think about you know, the data that's being used for, for cloud computing, this is a completely different question. And this may also have very important impacts on, on the economy. But we do think that what firms do with their data is very much related to the amount of uncertainty that they face. And so what, uh, what these data allow them to do is basically better predict um, um, the demand for the goods that they sell. And by focusing on that, we think of, of course, of data as information to improve these uh, 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 predictions. And we're going to focus in, in specifically on, on, on consumer demand. And with that, we're going to ask, you know, firms are going to make upfront investments. Okay? And the objective today is to try and find a, a, a framework, in, a conceptual framework, how we can think about it. Because ultimately, these investments that they make, anticipating the ability to predict better the, uh, uh, the consumer demand, uh, these upfront investments are going to have an implication uh, throughout the entire economy, but they're also going to have an implication in terms of the competition that these firms are going to face with uh, the firms in their market. For example, if you think about what's going to happen is that if there's more uncertainty, the firms are going to scale back their uh, uh, investment, they're going to also scale back the quantity that they produce. And so the uncertainty is going to have a direct implication for pricing and, and, and the quantity uh, uh, production. So in a sense, what we really want to do is we want to introduce the, the, the pricing of risk in firms' decisions uh, as they uh, are competing with other firms. Now, the effect is going to be ambiguous because data affects competition. And so on the one hand, data is also going to allow you to increase rent extraction. And so there's going to be one force that says, you know, OK, data is good. It reduces risk. So more data, less risk, so you can reduce the market. But at the same time, depending on the uh, market structure, what's going to happen is also that you can extract more rents from the customers because you're more competitive relative to the other firms in the market. And so there's going to be an ambiguous uh, effect that we're going to try and, 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 and find out what does this, uh, or to sign if you want this ambiguous effect. Now, one of the side products, or I would say maybe the main product that we find out, and this is something I say side product, but we didn't really anticipate this, is that we're going to be focusing on multi-product firms. And what happens is that as you have more information, okay, what you're going to do is you're going to kind of focus your resources, if you want, okay, to the goods where basically you have the lowest cost. And with more information, you can do that better. If I have very noisy pieces of information about all the goods that I produce, I'm just going to price everything about the same. But now if I have information on, on one particular good where the demand is high and another good that the, where the demand is low, I'm going to focus my production towards that kind of high demand good, which before with little information I couldn't do. And this is going to have important implications for how we see the distribution, therefore the aggregation of prices and markups between product markets, markups, and firm level markups, because the firm level is going to take that aggregation of it. And not only that, we can also see important aggregate 
differences when we go from the firm level to the industry level or the sector level. Okay. And these aggregation uh, uh, findings come all from the fact that more information allows you to be more specific which goods uh, uh, to target. And finally, kind of a flip side or a, a, an alternative way of looking at these aggregation results is that if you now think about cyclicality, this is going to have important implications for the cyclicality of markups or prices, depending on what level of aggregation or disaggregation you look at. And I'm going to come back to the debate about, you know, are markups pro-cyclical or counter-cyclic, and it depends on which markup you're going to be uh, measuring. If I have time towards the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about the dynamic version, because that allows us to say something about what is called data barter. That is, you charge your customers in exchange for the information that they give you. Okay? And that is going to lower the price for the good that you sell. Here's kind of a, 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 an, um, two pieces of information that tell us that there's something going on in terms of how we aggregate uh, um, uh, markups. These are two series. Well, let me see. There's four series, but let me start on the left. Two series. One is the sales weighted markup, firm level individual firm uh, markup, aggregated weighted by sales. That's the red line. And the uh, uh, dashed line is the same individual firm market, uh, uh, firm market, but weighted now by cost. And we see that there's a huge difference. Okay? Now, it's also, of course, related to what is the distribution of markups and that joint distribution with sales and cost. And we are going to, and I'm going to show that we have something to say uh, about that. And a similar kind of dispersion, if you want, or, or, or disparity if, uh, between the sales weighted markup and the industry weighted markup. Okay? And so what I'm going to try and argue is that if you interpret this through the lens of this framework that I'm going to propose, this allows you to understand why these aggregations are going to be different. So very briefly, I want to say we're going to build a model that's based on, a, I think, a beautiful model by, by Pellegrino, which allows for a very large market uh, of competing firms. It doesn't have to be you know, a two-firm duopoly. You can have thousands of market, uh, mar uh, firms sorry, in the market. Um, and the nice thing about that setup is that you, know, you can have very uh, general gener uh, uh, heterogeneity in terms of preferences uh, uh, that, that, that you can uh, allow in that market. The key thing here is that it's driven by a very kind of uh, uh, simple linear demand uh, framework, and basically all the heterogeneity comes in how competitive or close in competition these firms are going to be through their uh, elasticities of substitution. What we're going to add to that model, we're going to build on that model, we're going to add risk aversion uh, and investment in, in, in data. There's interesting work by Burstein, Carvalho, and Grassi on the cyclicality of markets. What we're adding to this is that we show that this data accumulation can be a, a driver behind that dispersion in the aggregation that I talked to, uh, to you about. There's a, quite a bit of work on, on the data economy in general. It's important for us here that we talk about strategic interaction between firms. Many of these models, or most of these models, are, are uh, perfect or monopolistic competition. And it's key that there's strategic interaction between firms. Okay, That makes uh, a difference. And then in terms of the evidence, because as I said, this is a conceptual framework. I'm not going to show you a, a, a quantification of the model. But there's a, a, a fascinating paper, a recent paper, by Galdon, Gil, and uh, uh, Uriton on data from a, a bank. And that bank did an interesting experiment. It gave its best customers a, a access to information on the market in which they were operating. And this was about quantities and prices that were being charged in, in that market, because the bank had that information. They had this these, uh, transaction information. And now, interestingly, they were pushing this information to the customers online, so they knew which firms were looking at it, which had opened it, and they even knew how long they had been looking at it. Okay. And what they found in that analysis is that the firms that had been looking at that information, they were actually changing their pricing and production decisions okay, towards the higher opportunity, higher profit uh, 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 goods and, and markets. And they saw an increase in their profitability you know, between 5 and 10%. So this was, was uh, sizable. Okay. And I think this captures exactly what we're trying to uh, uh, model here, which is this, this notion that you use the information in terms of the kind of type of goods that you want to target, because you have better information about the different markets in which you're operating. 
something that we're in the progress of doing that I won't have anything to say about uh, today is really about revenue forecasts. So we have IBIS data on the forecast of firm. And, and basically the spread between the realization and the forecast is gonna tell us something about how informed you are. And so we wanna try and exploit this in the, th through the lens of, uh, of the model. All right, the model is fairly uh, technical, so let me just give you kind of the, the, the flavor of, of the model. There's gonna be a large number of uh, firms that produce multiple goods. Okay, this is the whole thing. I mean, we can look at a special case of having one good per firm, but it's the whole uh, issue is about the bundle of different goods that you're uh, producing. And then in the first stage, you're gonna have an investment decision which determines your marginal cost. There's an old literature by John Sutton who's arguing that really that's what happens in an IO setting. Firms really make upfront investments in order, you know, which is a fixed cost if you want, in order to lower their uh, uh, marginal cost. Now the key thing for us is uh, you can see that there's in, in the profits of the firm, there's a term that includes a variance. Okay? And that variance is basically measuring how averse you are to risk. Yeah, you might say typically firms, you know, we assume that they're risk neutral, but there's a lot of evidence that firms actually do price risk and that risk plays a role. And uh, Laura keeps telling me that's what we teach MBAs. She says, you know, when we uh, talk to MBAs, it's all about how can you as a firm manage the risk that you face through demand or maybe through cost or other uh, uh, sources, maybe through competitors. And the, uh, the, the parameter row I is, is going to be basically measuring how sensitive you as a firm are to this risk. And this is the equivalent of the risk aversion that we would have for a, uh, a, a household. Okay. And then once you observe the data, you're going to choose a quantity of production to maximize the profits. Just, I'm referring to this paper by uh, Gorenichenko, Koyubon, and uh, Kumar, who basically shows that firms do react to uh, uh, um, uh, these, this, this uncertainty, both in, in their uh, uh, investment and their production. So they basically use this uh, uh, forecast information. And then there's an information set that says, you know, what do the firms uh, know? So on the demand side, what we have, we have this system of linear uh, demands in these uh, uh, many markets, and there's uncertainty that shifts up and down the demand. And this is gonna be, by the way, we have kind of a standard quadratic normal setting with linear demands and, and normal shocks, which allows us to use basically matrix algebra to solve this very large system uh, of, of equations. And the shock is gonna be normal um, with uh, a potential correlation between the, these markets. Now I'm gonna take data always exogenous here. I'm gonna show you results as I you know, change the amount of data we have. And the way I'm gonna do this here is I'm gonna say that there's more or less draws from that one distribution that gives you a signal. So there's a signal that says, you know, it's centered around the mean, the true mean of what the demand is, but there's uncertainty around this. And of course, the higher that variance is, the more uncertainty there is. But by measuring the number of draws, I basically reduce the variance, okay? So it's a standard normal uh, setup. So more draws give you a distribution with uh, lower variance. And that's gonna be our measure for more or less uh, variance. It's important here that you can think of making that problem very complex. One of the ways, the easiest way to make it complex is to allow for private information on the signals. We're gonna assume that the data is actually public. Why? Because with private information, we get strategic uncertainty, we get issues of signaling and the problem becomes uh, much more complex. So what I'm gonna show you today is everything in terms of public information. So just to give you a flavor, if you think about you know, the standard solution to this problem, okay, what is the, from the first order condition, how much should you produce in stage two, given the information that you have given, whatever your marginal cost is, there's basically a relationship between, well, on the one hand, the expected profits that you make per unit, okay? And then there's the, 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 the denominator, which basically tells you something about the price impact. Now, what's new in this denominator is that this variance turns up, okay? And the higher variance basically means that you're gonna lower the quantity that you produce. So this higher variance term, this is kind of the inverse here. So this H term, this H uh, uh, matrix has variance in here. So the higher the variance is that basically the lower that quantity of production is gonna be. You anticipate risk, you dislike risk, and you're gonna uh, scale back the, 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 the production. Now, clearly this matrix H is governing the covariance between the quantity and the price. And this is gonna be key. Okay, because you know, the information is gonna govern this uh, 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 quantity price uh, covariance. 
I already referred to this uh, evidence by uh, uh, the paper on, on, on the banking, which is basically telling us something about the covariance, because the more information I have, that basically says I'm going to be able to charge a higher price for these uh, 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 more informed uh, outcomes. Now, in stage one, basically I have another optimal uh, uh, choice by the firm, and this is going to tell me what the optimal decision is to invest, and this is going to basically lead firms who have you know, more information, who have more precise data for them to invest more in uh, uh, cost reduction, and there's going to be a date investment complementarity here that comes out of it. Okay. And this gives us a markup uh, uh, that's going to be de de defined as usual, basically the uh, price, in this case the expected price over the marginal uh, cost. And so higher investment is going to raise these product markets. This is kind of this rent extraction uh, that we saw, uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier, that's going on. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at, at some of the, the results that we find here. So face, first of all, data reduces the uh, market risk premium. I think it's fairly straightforward or intuitive that if you have more uh, information, basically you're going to increase your quantity on average, and you're going to lower uh, the, the, the prices. And this is coming from the fact that you can go to each good in particular. You can be more sp specific about how much you're going to be uh, producing. Now, there's, of course, the counterbalancing effect, and the, the, you know, the net effect is such that there's going to be an increase in the product markets when the risk price okay, or the marginal cost of inf investment is sufficiently low, because there's these two uh, uh, forces going on. Let me show you just kind of a simulation. This is a low cost of investment case, and on the horizontal axis, we have the number of signals, so that's more data. As my data increases, I'm going to see an increase in the markup here. Okay. Why? Because this investment cost uh, is, is uh, uh, small. Notice that as I have more information, both my price and my costs, marginal costs, decrease. It's just about which one decreases faster than the other one. With a high investment cost, we're going to have the opposite. Still, we see a decline in prices, we see a decline in costs, but what happens is that with a high investment cost, the cost is going to decline much less. Okay, and I think that's fairly intuitively. If I have to pay a high cost, this is not going to have much of a, 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 a positive effect on cost reduction because it's too expensive. And therefore, the price to cost ratio is going to actually uh, fall, which we see what's on the uh, left panel. Let's come to aggregation and ask, you know, what happens when we aggregate here? So what is the firm level uh, markup? It's basically the average or the expected markup of uh, uh, all the, the, the goods that uh, uh, we have. And here this covariance term turns up. Okay? The covariance term is basically telling us you know, the correlation uh, uh, between the price and the quantities of each of these goods. And what you're going to do is, as a firm, again, you're going to basically you know, set your pricing decisions or your quantity decisions in the direction of the goods that are basically generating the higher uh, uh, profits. So basically, data is therefore going to create a wedge between the product and the firm market. Because if I'm uninformed, I have very little information, then I'm going to price all the goods more or less the same. Now, if I know that one good is having a very high demand and another good has a very low demand, I'm going to basically price these goods very differently. I'm going to produce a high quantity of the high demand good and a low quantity of the low demand good, because that's where the profitability is higher. Okay? And so the date is going to make that product firm markup uh, uh, diverge. And here is an, uh, uh, an example, a simulation, where I see the case where the product markup, basically the average of each of the uh, uh, products, uh, is, is declining, whereas the firm markup uh, is increase, increasing because it's precisely for the weights and that composition effect. Now, if this happens um, at the level of the product to firm, this is also going to happen when I'm going to aggregate towards the industry. And so let's just uh, uh, now calculate the different types of markups that we can uh, uh, envisage, envisage here. So we have the unweighted market, for example. So the unweighted market is just the, uh, uh, the, the unweighted sum of the firm level markups. The cost weighted markup is basically the sum of markups weighted by their cost share. And you have the cost share here on the right. And the sales weighted markup is exactly the same, but now the weight is the sales weight. Um, notice that why are these going to be different? Because, of course, firms with a lot of market power are going to have high sales shares and relatively small cost shares. Why? Because their price with market power is very high. 
So for the same quantity of production, you're going to have basically a much higher uh, uh, price, and that's going to increase the sales share more than it does uh, the cost share. And then finally, the ind industry uh, aggregate markup is given by basically the average. Is I'm just summing sales in the industry over uh, cost in the industry. By the way, this is just, I don't want you to, to, to stare uh, too much at this, but you know, in this setup, the industry market is exactly the same as the cost-weighted market. It's just a mathematical property uh, of, of these. The reason is because if you think about this, you know, how did I define the industry market? I just said sum all the sales and divide it by the sum of all the costs. Now, if I cost-weigh, okay, basically I exactly cancel out the cost weight by uh, uh, in that summation. And what it says is that in the cost weighted market, I don't really care about the distribution. It's only about averages. Okay, that's what this uh, is saying. Okay, so now if I look at the industry uh, markup, there's some differences here, you know, where growing data is going to increase the difference between the cost weighted and the unweighted market. That's the first uh, results. Why? Because high data, high market firms uh, produce more. Second, the difference between the sales-weighted markup and the cost-weighted markup is diverging because of what I mentioned earlier, that the weight, the sales weight is more dispersed than the cost uh, weight. And then, of course, we have the, uh, uh, the, the difference between the sales-weighted markup and the uh, industry uh, uh, average markup because that, again, doesn't include this uh, or doesn't put any weight on the distribution. Here are some, uh, again, some, some simulations where we show the different uh, types of markups. In red, we have the sales weighted markup. Uh, the dashed one is the uh, uh, industry aggregate, and uh, uh, in blue is the average firm level markup, unweighted. Okay. And you get, depending on the amount of data, you get this dispersion that we were uh, uh, talking about. So this is the type of, of dispersion that you would generate that we see in the data. Okay, that um, I mean the facts and using data could explain what we see uh, in, in, in the facts. Okay, cyclicality. I'm sure this audience is aware of a kind of markup discussion in the literature between, on the one hand, Bills uh, and a set of older papers saying that markups are counter cyclical and, and Bills had used aggregate markups. So he basically is used the equivalent of our industry level markups. And some more recent work by Remy and Nicarda says, but we don't find any such evidence of countercyclical uh, markups in a disaggregated uh, uh, economy. In a sense, they use firm level uh, um, data on, on measuring markups. And so I guess that's an issue for how to interpret the new Keynesian model. What we're seeing here is that if we think about the recession as being a shock where the demand falls, but at the same time, the variance or the uncertainty, if you want, increases. Maybe we have less data or it's from some exogenous reason with the same data, we have to interpret that uh, information with more uh, noise. Then both can be right. And the reason is because you have a different type of response in terms of the aggregation. Because if I look at the product market um, uh, um, markup, then this could be pro-cyclical, given that I interpret this recession as being higher variance, whereas the firm or industry market can be counter-cyclical. Okay? Now it's, a, it's a, a quantitative question, it's an empirical question, whether this is borne out uh, in the data. But this framework tells us we have to be very careful which markups to look at and how to aggregate. It's important whether you look at product market um, uh, markups firm level markups or industry level markups. And this provides a potential for uh, uh, kind of trying to, 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 to marry these two in, in interpretations or these two pieces of evidence between Bills and um, uh, Remy and Nicarda, which I think could be uh, an, an interesting way to, uh, uh, to take this quantitatively. Okay, let me just kind of say the last thing on, on, on what we do and, and, and leave it maybe a little bit more kind of uh, open in the sense that we think of dynamic competition because what I showed you so far was all static. Now the question is, what if I have a repeated setting where I have this pricing? And the first kind of concern we have in these repeated pricing problems is that, well, these are very hard problems in terms of, you know, who are my competitors? Let's uh, uh, kind of model two things separately. We assume that you're assigned to a new market in each period, but what you're going to do with your customers, 
okay, is you're going to take into account the value of the information that you get from your customers. Okay? And so if you look at exactly the same first order condition written in terms of my pricing and quantity decision, which is here, it's the same as before. This was this H matrix that I had before. Okay? And now, instead of just having the profit, the expected profits, there's going to be a continuation value that I take into account because by pricing now in a different way or by setting a quantity in a different way, I can generate more information. And basically, if I get more sales, I get more information. So I'm be willing to lower your price, i.e. increase the quantity of production, in order to generate information about what your customer wants in the future. Okay. And this is going to basically show up in your quantity decision. And this is going to tell us something about you know, the value of uh, um, information or the value of these data uh, in, in, in obtaining this. I get a look from our chair, so I should just uh, uh, quickly go to the uh, conclusion. We basically have a, a, a framework uh, to interpret the existing facts uh, in the light of uh, using uh, data to do that. I think it's, it's a very simple framework. It's very specific on the data, but I think it gives us some insights into what the forces are in terms of determining markups. One is market power, two is risk, and in a dynamic setting, it is uh, data barter. And we have to be very careful which data we look at and how we aggregate markups if you want to draw conclusions kind of for uh, the, the, the macro uh, economy because these covariances are key in driving different uh, measurements. Thank you so much. The discussion is Martin Derrida. Martin is an assistant professor of economics at the London School of Economics. Martin, you have 15 minutes. Thanks very much. Uh, it's great to be back here. It's been a fantastic week, so thanks so much for hosting me. And thanks for inviting me uh, to discuss this paper by Jan and Laura, who are two of my, uh, two of my academic uh, heroes. So what's the paper about? So the paper is about these two trends. The left-hand graph here plots the cost of, of storing uh, data, the right-hand uh, graph plots uh, trends in aggregate markups. Now, over time, it's become much cheaper to store data. If you wanted to store a terabyte of data in the, um, in, uh, in, in the 1990s, uh, you'd spend about $5 million to do that. If you, want to stare, if you want to store a terabyte of data today, it'll cost you something between $13 and $20. Right? So it's become much easier for firms to store, to analyze data, and therefore to actively use data in, in business decisions. Now, as we have saw this dramatic decline in the price of, of, of data and data analysis, there's been a steady rise in the markup, which is the ratio of prices over marginal cost. And the question that uh, Jan and Laura ask in this paper is, is are these two uh, linked? Or more specifically, how are markups, market power, and prices related in this new, in this new data economy? Now, there were two polar views on the effects that data uh, might have in the economy. The one point of view is that data enables firms to extract more surplus from consumers, for example, by charging higher markups. This is more optimistic view, um, also from Laura's prior work, that data enables firms to make more efficient decisions by reducing uncertainty. And the intriguing thesis of this paper is that even when a rise in data usage comes with an increase in markups, that doesn't necessarily mean that firms are just extracting, extracting rent. It might actually come from more efficient decision making on, uh, the, uh, on, the side of, um, on the side of firms. So I should have clicked through the slides. There you go. All right, so how did they get to that conclusion? So the mechanism is as follows. The core assumption in the model by, by Jan and Laura is that firms um, can increase their scale by cutting marginal costs of producing products with particular features. But that requires firms to make upfront decisions about which features in products um, uh, to invest in. And firms don't always know what kind of features are going to be popular. Maybe this year we like blue t-shirts, maybe, uh, maybe next year we're going to like, uh, we're going to like red t-shirts. So there's uncertainty in the kind of upfront investments that firms have to make. And the key assumption in the model is that data is a forecasting tool. It helps 
firms resolve the uncertainty about which features of products uh, the consumer is going, to, is going to like. Now, that in general is going to have an ambiguous effect on markups. On the one hand, it's going to lower markups because less risk means that firms are willing to cut their prices because firms are risk averse, right? So there's less of a risk premium in prices. But there's also a positive effect in markups, and that's because these higher upfront investments cut marginal costs and firms don't pass that entire reduction in marginal costs through to consumers. And what the paper shows is that as long as it's feasible for firms to use data to cut marginal costs, we're going to see an increase in markups when firms have more access to data. Now, all of that applies at the product level, so firms are selling multiple, multiple products. And finally, if you measure markups at the firm level, which is usually what we're limited to doing with available data sets, there will even be a, a stronger positive effect of data on, on markups. And that's because data enables firms to reallocate their capacity towards products that are going to be the most, uh, the most, uh, the most profitable. Okay, so you get an increase of markups coming from uh, an increase in uh, the ability of firms to make correct, correct decisions. So we're in a policy place here, right? So why should we care about this? Well, it turns out that obviously for antitrust policy, right, it's, it's very clear why, there's, why it's important to think, about, to think about markups. In particular, if we see an increase in markups that comes from the fact that firms are making clever decisions that reduce costs, there's no ground for antitrust. But also for monetary policy, the findings in this paper are important because for monetary policy, we usually think that markups are a contractionary supply shocks. Indeed, it was said earlier, if you take a model like Smets and Wouters, uh, markup shocks actually explain a lot of in inflation dynamics. But what this paper shows is that um, markups, an increase in markups can actually reflect a positive supply shock because it can come from firms making clever upfront investments that lower the cost of producing goods that consumers desire, but they just don't pass an entire cost reduction through. Right? So the big lesson, if you want one lesson here for, for monetary policy, is that an increase of markups is not necessarily a negative uh, supply shock. So my discussion is as follows. I really enjoyed reading this paper. It was great to finally read it in, in detail. It offers an, an original and intuitive way to think about how production, uncertainty, and data are linked. And what I perhaps like best about the paper that it challenges our textbook thinking on the links between pricing, market power, and, and markups, because what the authors show is that through data, uh, markups can increase even when firms' market power, defined as their ability to affect the market price, is, is, is unchanged. Um, and they show uh, that this explains various trends in, say, cyclicality of markups, but also different measures of aggregate markups. I'm going to have three comments, and the theme of my discussion for the next 10 minutes is going to be that um, it is unclear at this stage yet whether when firms use data to raise markups, whether that is actually as benign as the authors claim. To do so, I'm going to cover three things. I'm going to talk about alternative mechanisms through which uncertainty reducing data can, um, can actually lead to rent extraction instead of, instead of uh, this reduction in, uh, in, uh, in production costs. I'm then going to provide some empirical evidence on the mechanisms in the paper. And actually, I'm, I'm going to be positive because the empirical evidence that I'm going to show today actually lends support to quite some of the predictions in the paper that, that will show. So perhaps the more pessimistic alternative mechanisms aren't, uh, aren't at play. But then at the, at the final end of the conclusion I'm, uh, of the discussion, I'm going to uh, explain that once we integrate business dynamism and growth in the analysis, then even if data reduces uncertainty and therefore enables firms to make more efficient decisions, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is good news for, um, for consumers or the economy as a whole. So to start with the, the somewhat cheaper comments, uh, there are other mechanisms through which data can have uh, negative effects uh, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the economy through markups. In particular, even if data reduces uncertainty, that can cause rent extraction. And I've got two simple examples on the slides. One is that in practice, firms face uncertainty about willingness to pay among consumers. We don't know which consumers are the ones that are willing to pay a lot for the product and which uh, consumers are, are not. We don't even know how much dispersion in consumer types there is. And price, uh, sorry, data, is exactly enabling firms uh, to know what the customer that they're facing is willing to pay for a product. That can help them to achieve first degree price discrimination 
either explicitly to charging people individualized prices or, and this is something that firms are doing more actively in practice, they can segment uh, th their product offering in order for firms, for, um, for consumers to self-sort into, uh, into narrower um, uh, uh, price bins. Now, first degree price discrimination doesn't necessarily mean that markups cause a supply shock, but it does mean a shift of welfare away from consumers towards towards firms, right? So I would say that that is less benign. In general, also uh, firms also face uncertainty about the price elasticity of demand that firms, uh, that firms uh, face. And for a risk averse firm, as in this paper, there's uncertainty about the price elasticity of demand, it might be wise to charge a lower markup. So if, price, if data enables you to learn about uh, the fact that the price elasticity of demand is, is relatively low, firms can raise their markups and therefore, therefore extract, extract, uh, extract rents. So these are two examples of where data reduces uncertainty, but it doesn't necessarily affect the welfare of consumers. So we need empirical evidence to tell which of uh, the stories is, is true. And the, and the paper offers a lot of testable predictions. The paper suggests that data should raise upfront investments, thus lower marginal cost, raise fixed costs. Data should raise markups if there is a positive effect of data on fixed cost. Data should make the variance of earnings lower because it's reducing uncertainty in which upfront investments to take. And the final prediction of the model that I put two exclamation marks behind because it's an important one for uh, this particular paper is data should raise the covariance of firm size and markups. And that's important because if data is used through markups to just extract rent, you would expect firms that are using data to raise their price, therefore face less demand, and you should see that the firms that raise their markups are shrinking. So you get less of a covariance between markups and, and, and firm size. So these are things that you could uh, take to the data. Now, I already used my cheap comment, so this comment I couldn't be cheap again, right? So I'm actually gonna try and test these predictions in the data uh, myself. Now, the one difficult thing, of course, to uh, take uh, a question to take these questions to the data is to have information on how much data firms can actually use. So the premise of the next few slides is going to be that in practice, one of the vehicles through which firms have been able to uh, access data and to use data and business decisions is access to the internet. Now access to the internet didn't just give firms access to data, which is what we need for identification here, but there's also a lot of variation in when firms got access to the internet. And a lot of that variation in various countries is random. In France, for example, broadband was rolled out in a staggered fashion based on the local telecom equipment that had been installed decades earlier. So within French cities, there's a lot of variation in which cities, in which block city blocks got access to, to broadband internet first. So we can use variation in that to see if we compare firms in narrow industries in the same region, but just being based on a block of streets that had internet access, whether they have the type of trends in fixed costs and markups that the, uh, uh, that the authors predict. So in this graph, I'm plotting that effect. So this graph here is a difference and difference estimation using a standard estimator by Callaway and Santana on the effect of broadband internet on uh, upfront investments. And what you see is that fixed cost investment increase after broadband internet. So broadband internet here, the access happens at time zero. And what you see is that over time, the ratio of fixed cost over uh, total cost increases in these areas that have had that have had broadband internet compared to firms in areas to do not, that do not yet have broadband internet. And the elasticity here is large. The elasticity is about 0.5, right? So there's a 50% increase in the ratio of fixed over, um, over total cost. To give you an idea, that ratio is usually about 10%, right? So it goes from 10 to 15%, right? So there's an increase in upfront investment. At the same time as this increase in upfront investments, there's an increase in markups as well. And that's what this plot shows you. So in these areas where firms are using access to internet to raise, um, to raise their upfront investments, firms don't fully pass those cost reductions on to consumers and their markups increase as a result. And again, the elasticities here are, are very sizable, right? So we're talking here about an increase in the level, so in the, the log markup of, of 0.15 on a basis of something like 20% on, uh, on, uh, on average. The other two predictions, uh, we cannot estimate at the firm level, so these are firm level regressions here, uh, but the decline in the variance of earnings, we would have to measure at the city level, so I can, within a city, see how the variance of earnings changes after there's access to internet, again, taking fixed effects for, for the region that the city, the city is in. And what you see is that after broadband, inter, after broadband internet access, there's a decline in the 
variance of earnings. So that again is consistent with the story by Jan and, and Laura. So final thing, and this is the, the key thing that the, that the model predicts. In, this, in the model that we've seen today, when firms have access to data, there's a stronger increase in the correlation between size and markups because firms that use broadband or that use data to make upfront investments, their optimal scale increases and their markup increases. So you get a greater positive covariance between size and, uh, and markups. Now there's a question of how to measure size. I've used two measures of size here. I've used sales as well as total variable costs, which should both be positively related to markups in this model. And what you again see is that in the aftermath of access to broadband, that covariance increases. So I think there's a growing empirical case for uh, the predictions that the authors have in, 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 in their model. Critical remark, of course, is that I'm limited here to just broadband internet versus, versus not having access to broadband internet, right? So the next question is, can you use more direct measures of actual access uh, to data? Although I do think we can agree, right, that internet really facilitated, facilitated, um, uh, facilitated that. So then my more critical remark on the paper, um, which is that once we start not just thinking about a static economy in which there is some firms that produce the same amount year on year, but we add growth and business dynamism, you can actually get very different predictions for the effect of data on consumer, on consumer welfare. And so this benign view that we've seen today might still not exactly, uh, exactly hold. And that's because data gives incumbent firms a comparative advantage compared to entrants. And that's because data is generated through transactions. If I've seen my customers in the past, I know more about them. Right? So there's a natural way in which um, incumbents benefit more from data than, uh, than, uh, than, uh, than entrants. So I don't have a toy model, but I have a reasoning that is backed by an actual, uh, an actual model. So let me give you that. So imagine a world in which firms produce multiple products, like the paper that we have here. And if firms innovate, um, they extend the set of products that they, that they produce. They enter markets that were initially dominated by competitors. That means innovation, extending um, uh, your set of products, comes with creative destruction. I have to come better at producing a good that other firms were initially market leaders in. Now that process of creative destruction, where I come up with higher quality versions of goods that consumers demand, works best when there's a level, a level playing field. So if the entrants and the incumbents have access to the same information, because if I then innovate and develop a better quality version of a good, I am going to be able to take over uh, market leadership. Data changes that, right? So in a world where incumbents can use data to, um, to cut their costs, even if an entrant develops a more innovative, higher quality version of a product, an incumbent can undercut entrants on price, therefore keep them out of the market, prevent that process from, of creative destruction from driving long run, long run growth, et cetera. And if you empirically look at what that kind of model would predict, it looks very much like what we've just seen. You get an increase in markups, there's gonna be more upfront investments in data by incumbents. The incumbents are gonna get larger and larger firms have lower earnings variance. Uh, and firms that are large and profitable, these incumbents are, um, uh, are also going to innovate and expand into more markets. So you get a higher market markup size covariance. Um, so with that, I'm out of time. I loved reading the paper and I look forward to hearing the uh, uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Jan, why don't you take some time to respond to Martin? Well, first of all, I mean, this is beyond the line of duty. I mean, this is a, the discussion is worth more than the presentation. So thank you very much for the, uh, the very detailed comments and also for the empirical work. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, impressed with uh, what you did. Thank you for, for that. Um, on the points you made, I'm just going to, you know, I don't have much to say, but, but on the alternative mechanisms point is very well taken. We have looked not at price discrimination, but we've looked at um, uh, shocks to cost instead of to demand that might have a different uh, uh, impact. As it turns out, you know, the, the, what is the thing about you look under for your keys under the lamppost because that's where the light is. This model is very restrictive in what we can do, and and you know to to get the type of structure that we can uh, use and solve, um, we can only basically have shocks in particular parts of, of the model. But I, it's a point very well taken that predictions might look different depending on where the source of the uh, uncertainty is, in particular what you mentioned also, the uh, elasticity of substitution. 
Um, empirical evidence, as I said before, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm impressed. I, I, I love it. I think it's, it's very interesting how you uh, relate this evidence on the broad, broadband uh, uh, rollout uh, and, and kind, of, uh, uh, kind of hitting those, those uh, results. Um, the same thing with your comment on the business dynamism. Things change, of course, if you have a... You know, one thing, we, we talked about the dynamics which gives rise to data barter, but there's an additional twist in these... Uh, Schumpeterian models because there's an, 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 a first mover advantage and that first mover advantage is going to play a big role in how you can um, uh, exert that, that, that rent extraction, uh, mon uh, that, that uh, market power. There's one thing I wanted to say, you know, in general, the, 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 when you mentioned at the outset uh, what can we do in terms of competition policy, I think it's not unambiguously a good news show. I mean, there's two opposing effects. There's, there's, there's the rent extraction and, and there's the efficiency gain, if you want, from using, uh, using information or data. First of all, the net effect can be negative, so then still antitrust policy would, would have a role. As you were talking, and I haven't thought about this very carefully, but maybe there's a mechanism design approach in a sense where you can tease out the two different components. That is, if you have some pieces of information from the, uh, the firms and you have an idea of what kind of information that they use, what kind of data that they use, maybe you can tease out you know, the positive effect, which is the reallocation effect, uh, from the rent extraction uh, effect. Now that's you know, very uh, vague at this point because I haven't uh, thought this through, but they're, they're, you know, given that you see detailed prices and quantities, you can use that covariance structure maybe to design policies to, 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 to separate it. Uh, but it's very uh, hypothetical in, in this, uh, at this moment. Thank you. We have uh, time for questions uh, from the floor. No? Hi, Gaetano Gaballo from RCC. I was thinking to which extent the model can be recast in a, in a, in a story about advertising that is producing data uh, which seems like to have some feature similar to what you said, like to, to your story in the sense that there, there are efficiency gain also for informing consumers about the future of, of, of the model. So I, I want to, to understand whether you thought about that. I think it's a great point. We have chosen also for modeling reasons to put the investment up front before you realize the information, but you could also have investment in information and advertising would be one of those. So for example, if at the cost I can increase the number of, in the model, the number of, of draws that I have, um, we played around with it, we didn't make much progress, but I think it's a, it's a fascinating question again, because if you think about it, I, you know, this is something that's probably very uh, uh, relevant. It's even beyond advertising. If I just think, you know, shall I really go about and hire people to start to process the, the data? That's also a costly, because a lot of firms have the data, but they don't do anything with it. So you have to make an, a, a costly investment in order to make that data useful. Um, and in the example of the paper I mentioned about the bank, the bank was offering this to its clients. Okay. In the end, they didn't do it because it was a commercial decision not to do it, but the initial idea was we're going to start as an experiment, and this is what the paper is based on. We're going to give that information to our clients. We offer that consulting service to them, okay? And if they like it, in the long run, they wanted to charge for it, but then they found out that commercially it was not a good idea to do that. But that's exactly, I think, what you're uh, hinting at, that, that you, you pay a cost for more uh, information. And at the moment, we haven't uh, gone that way to, to model it, but I think it's a, indeed a very interesting question. Vida? Yeah. Uh, does this work? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, just a, a small comment and question. A small comment is on the last point by Martin. Uh, uh, this data you know, works as a barrier to entry or can work as a barrier to entry. can explain, you know, the Philip Pond story of uh, over time, actually, the diminishing of the business dynamism, uh, for example, in the U.S. Right, over time, uh, and that uh, will actually uh, it's a piece of evidence that goes in favor of, of, of the last Martin slide. Uh, the question is, uh, you might expect that this data thing is very different across sectors. So there must be some sectors in which this thing is very important, and some other sectors in which it's not. So uh, if you look at that, or do you think? Of 
It's interesting. Uh, great question. So on the declining di dynamism, I agree. Um, you know, we see a relationship between kind of market power and, and dynamism. My gut reaction is this is going beyond uh, uh, Martin's point about the, the Schumpeterian setting, but if it's in the non-Schumpeterian setting that I, I uh, presented, this would seem to suggest that the negative effect of the rent extraction dominates because the reason why the markups lead, lead to this, this decline in the dynamism is because there's basically less pass-through. Okay, and I, my gut reaction is that, that that would tell us something about, you know, between the efficiency gains and the rent extraction, this seems to suggest it's the rent extraction that dominates. Um, of course, there's other things that also determine uh, declining damages, but this is something that I, I would love to pursue a little bit more and find out uh, what we can uh, say. On heterogeneity, ex ante, I would say yes. The only caveat I want to add to that is that when I started working on markups, like the first thing, and we looked for months uh, at that, is it, it must be because of tech. And so we looked at tech firms or industries where tech was, was, was uh, important. And then when we did these decompositions of markups within markets across industries, okay, we find that 95% you know, is within market. So across industry is small. But this is a different question from what you were saying. But I'm using this as an example to say that, you know, data is probably very similar to other sources of creating markup in the digital e economy. And what over time we've discovered is that even if you're in a traditional sector, and I like to use the example of textiles, okay, a declining sector, but we have firms like Inditex that are heavily using data. In particular, they use artificial intelligence, why? Because they predict the demand for their customers in the different stores. They uh, use heavily the fact that uh, uh, in order to produce the logistics of it, this is very data intensive. And that has given rise to this huge firm, okay, that acts like an Amazon in retail or like a Google in tech, but it's in a traditional industry. And, and there's a paper by Turlings and Van Kloster who look at not the sector they're in, but the um, the tech intensity of a firm in any sector. Mm -hmm. And they find that it's the firms that are most tech intensive that have the highest uh, markup. So, so in terms of heterogeneity, this is a long story, I'm not going to finish here because everyone want lunch, wants lunch, but uh, to say that it's probably tech, but it's not going to be by typically tech sector, it's going to be tech usage within firms, yeah. within any sector.